Now I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Leslie Strauss and Joe Belden. Leslie will get us started. She's our uh, senior po policy analyst. She's going to walk through the USDA side of the budget. So thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Dan. The first thing we're going to do is a little poll to see how familiar folks in the audience are with the USDA housing programs. If you can select one of the answers, very familiar, somewhat familiar, not familiar at all, that will help us to know how much background information we need to give. <coughs> and I see poll results pouring in. You guys probably can't see the poll as it's yes, can. happening. You can. Sorry. Still waiting. Wow. We have nobody who's completely unfamiliar with the programs. That's great. Okay. All right. I think we can end the mm -hmm. poll. Thank you, everybody. So the next couple of slides um, summarize the USDA programs. I'll just go through those really fast. As apparently everybody knows, USDA does both single-family and multifamily programs and also home repairs. These are the biggest single-family programs listed, um, with the exception of self-help, which is going to be separate. 502 Direct, 502 Guaranteed, which despite having the same number, are really different programs. 504 Loans and Grants, which go together, um, as indicated by having the same numbers. Those are the 502 programs are for purchase. 504 are for repairs when you already own your home. The um, 523 is the self-help TA technical assistance program, which provides local organizations with funding to help home builders work in groups to um, help build their own homes. Many of them, not all of them, get Section 502 mortgages, 502 direct mortgages. This is what the budget has for the single family programs. You're seeing the fiscal year 14 final. That's the year that just ended in September, the end of September. The fiscal 15, that's the current year, final appropriations, and the administration's budget for fiscal 16, which will start on October 1st, 2015. This year, most of the programs in the USDA Rural Housing Programs are proposed to be kept at about the same levels. You can see the two 502 programs would be at the same level. 504 loans and grants would be almost the same as last year, at, or the current year, pardon me. And self-help would be cut. The administration says that they expect to have enough money to renew all the self-help contracts it's the contracts with the local organizations, not the home buyers. All the contracts that are expiring, even though they're cutting the program funding, because they expect to have money held over, left over from previous years. Some programs, money continues on into next following years and can be used. Some of it doesn't. Some of you might, might be aware that they didn't use all the 502 direct money in fiscal 14, and the unused money there was just lost. But the self-help unused money can be used in future years. The other thing, a um, couple other things about the single-family programs, the um, 502 Direct program has had a packaging demonstration for local organizations to prepare applications for um, from potential home buyers. The um, other administration documents that go with the budget, some, one from USDA says that they anticipate fully implementing the packaging regulations in 2015. So even though packaging isn't doesn't show up in the budget number somewhere, that's um, what they're expecting to do. 
They also proposed two legislative changes to the 502 guaranteed program to make it more like the um, FHA programs. And that one is um, self-sustaining, so it, in terms of money, um, it can be that that big of a um, program because it pays for itself. Multifamily programs, again, are, oh, this is, sorry, this is the explanation. Section 515 and 514, 516 go to developers who are creating housing. 515 funds can also be used for preserving existing housing. 521 rental assistance is project-based. It, it's attached to the uh, fact that a property has a USDA mortgage. There's also a rental guarantee program. That's Section 538. As you can see on the slide, it serves slightly higher income tenants because it's guaranteed loans, which are at higher interest rates. This is what the budget proposes for these programs. You can see there's an increase for Section 538. That's the second line. That's another self-sustaining program um, with the fees paid by the um, banks generating the, the money to enable them to do that loan volume. 514 and 516 farm labor housing would be at about the same amount as the past couple of years. They do propose an increase in Section 515. 515 has not had any money available for new construction since, I think, fiscal 2012. I might be a year off one way or the other on that. The increased amount is intended to cover not only the amount of rental preservation that's been funded in 515 the last few years, but to increase 1.9 million of that added amount is to increase the preservation funding. The other 12 million that's added is for new construction. Again, um, they are planning to do, if this funding is approved, of course, they would do two properties, two new construction properties in each of four target areas, which are, one, the Promise Zone in the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma. The Choctaw Nation does not have a reservation, but apparently there are, there's a 10-county area in southeast Oklahoma that's designated as a Promise Zone. The, this sounds like two, but it's only one, the Promise and Strike Force Zones of Kentucky. Kentucky's Promise Zone is a specific group of seven or eight counties the strike force zones USDA designated for the whole country. I'm not sure if absolutely every state has one, but they are um, basically persistent poverty areas, places, counties that have had high poverty for um, a number of, over the course of a number of censuses. And a large part of the state of Kentucky is considered strike force zones. So places that are within either the Promise Zone or the Strike Force counties will be eligible for this new construction money. Also, the Strike Force Zones in Alabama and Strike Force places in Arkansas. That's the counties in Alabama and Arkansas comprise about half, the, half of each of those states. So there um, it sounds like a lot of counties, but in terms of the entire country, it, that's very limited um, ability for competition for new 515 projects. They do say that there will be 100% rental assistance available for those new construction properties. There, I'm going to talk a little bit more about rental assistance in a minute. The um, some of the 515 preservation money 
is supposed to be targeted to maturing or expiring mortgages, mortgages that are being paid off in the regular course of business, which is, as you probably know, a growing problem. But there's no explanation of, unless it's somewhere else that I haven't found yet, there's no explanation of of what they're going to do with money that's targeted to properties with maturing mortgages in the 515 program. Um, the same four target areas, they're also targeting uh, 515, 538, and MPR, that's one of the preservation programs, funds from those three and rental assistance for rehabilitation of two properties in each of those areas. and. A total of exactly, it uses the word exactly, 217 units of rental assistance <laughs> to help preserve properties that would um, incentive rental assistance, incentive RA, help preserve properties that might otherwise leave the programs. The, um, the way this targeted thing is supposed to work is they will select applications from among applications for the 515 MPR and 538 programs. So there's not a separate process, even though they're targeting specific amounts of money to specific places, they're not setting up a specific application process for that. And obviously you can ask questions if I'm getting some of this um, too confusing. Preservation programs, I mentioned MPR, that's the, it has a long name, um, that multifamily preservation and revitalization is what the MPR stands for. That's funding that can be used in a lot of different ways um, to preserve projects in the 515 and farm labor housing portfolios. They have had in the past a preservation revolving loan fund demonstration program that um, is money that goes to intermediaries, including HACK. HACK has some of that money available for lending. And USDA has its own voucher program, Section 542, which I will talk about in a minute. The funding in the budget for these preservation programs is the request is to go down a little bit for MPR funding to not fund the revolving loan fund, which is consistent with what Congress did for fiscal 15, and to increase the funding that's available for vouchers. Part of what the increased voucher funding is supposed to do is cover um, properties with expiring mortgages. As I mentioned, 521 rental assistance is attached to the existence of a USDA mortgage. So when the mortgage expires and is paid off in the normal course of business, the rental assistance goes away. So the property no longer has rental assistance and it no longer has that um, USDA subsidy for the, the mortgage and the USDA use restrictions that say it has to be for low-income people. So they are going to make, to, to mitigate the effect on the tenants, those tenants are proposed to be eligible for vouchers. In the past several years since they revitalized this voucher program, the vouchers have been used for properties in foreclosure or for properties that are um, prepaying their mortgages, paying their mortgages early and getting out of the program. So this would be a, an expansion that um, people like Hack have been supporting for a while of the voucher program. Rental assistance um, funding, again, would go up a little bit this year. The um, categories in, um, if you're looking at the slide, the categories in parentheses with the zeros are set-asides that have been in some appropriations bills and budgets in the past. As you can see, there are none of those set-asides in um, 14, 15, or proposed in 16, although one of USDA's documents says that 4.9 million of the increased amount it's asking for in rental assistance is for that initiative in the Promise Zone strike force areas. Um, so they 
they are intending to set some of it aside, which they have the authority to do. They expect this rental assistance amount to cover all the contracts that expired during fiscal 16. That adds the, they calculate rental assistance at an average of $4,603 per unit for one-year contracts. So this amount of money would support almost 254,600 254, units, which um, we hope is enough for everyone that needs it. There are another thing that's happening with rental assistance is that in the past, contracts were longer. Now contracts are one year. In the past, they were longer. And some of the old contracts are still just now getting to their expiration dates and expiring. So there will be some old contracts that need to be renewed that, makes, that contributes to the fact that the price, cost of rental assistance goes up every year. And again, as they did last year, they are proposing changes in the rental assistance program. The only one that Congress accepted and put in the, the appropriations for fiscal 15 is the second bullet there, the up to one, I'm sorry, the third bullet, um, no renewal before 12 months. If a rental assistance contract runs out of its money before 12 months because of higher utility costs or something like that, um, that cause the money to be used up faster than expected, then they don't get the funding renewed. The administration is proposing that for next year, as well as other items that it proposed last year, including the one that got the most attention, which is a $50 minimum rent. They calculate that that would bring in $5 million in fiscal 16 and then $10 million in each of the next few years by charging minimum rent to tenants who are currently paying less than $50 minimum rent. If you're currently paying less than $50 minimum rent, that means they calculated that your income was so low that you couldn't afford $50 minimum rent. And they say that there will be hardship exemptions as HUD has but I hear that the hardship exemptions for HUD do not always work. Tenants don't always know that they exist. Um, they don't always get applied. And so that's something that um, HAC is not supporting. I think that's enough. We're going to do one more poll, and then we're going to switch over to HUD. And we'll take questions at the end on rental assistance as well as HUD. I have one more slide about, I think I said all of this already, um, about the uh, changes they're proposing in the voucher program. Yeah. So I'm going to go on to this next poll which says, the budget was released on Groundhog Day. Does that mean we are in for a harsh winter? Please select yes, no, or I roll with the woolly bear caterpillar. <laughs> yes, this is a test to see who's awake. <laughs> <laughs> the woolly bear caterpillar is very popular. And I'm going to turn it over now to Joe Belton to talk about HUD. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's pretty hard to follow up a poll question about the groundhog, I guess, but we'll, we'll try here. Um, uh, as, as most of you know, um, Department of Housing and Urban Development does serve rural areas despite its name. Um, uh, uh, for example, uh, a study that we've done a couple of times at, at HAC and updated just a couple uh, uh, in 2012 uh, looked at where uh, subsidized housing is and, and we found, you'll see some numbers there on this slide, that there are over 200,000 
uh, rural units of public housing and, and Section 8 units and 64,000 uh, Section 202 senior housing units, almost 8,000 Section 811 um, housing units that are actually in, in rural America. And as most of you know, I'm sure, a lot of the CDBG funding and home funding also goes to, to rural areas and states and small cities. Um, the, the budget that came out uh, this week uh, for 2016 for HUD mostly has increases uh, in programs above the 2015 uh, final funding level, and that, of course, was only finished in December in the omnibus appropriation uh, bill for the current fiscal year. The only program that's proposed for major cuts, major program, is the, the, the CDBG Community Development Block Grants program uh, for next year. And in fact, um, this is a, a, a very aggressive budget for HUD. It's the highest uh, HUD proposal that's come from the Obama administration in its time in office. And the overall increase would, would be almost $4 billion from the current appropriated level in 15 to what the administration is proposing for 2016. Uh, excuse me. Um, and some of the, the specifics and these, these figures, um, as I think Leslie was alluding to, are also in our Hack News that went up this week and also on our website. And I, I should mention that, that if you don't get the hack news, you may want to sign up for that on our website because we will track what happens to these these um, uh, these these appropriated levels for both USDA rural housing and HUD programs as the process moves along all of this year. But you can see CDBG there is is proposed to be cut by 200 million. The home program has as as many of you probably know has gone down quite a bit in the last four or five years. So it's it's encouraging to see that proposed for a $160 million increase for next year. Um, the SHOP program that, that some of you may use, it's administered by, by Hack and Habitat and other organizations, is proposed for the third year in a row to be a set-aside as part of the, the home program. Um, some of the other uh, HUD programs, all, all proposed for increases there, as you can see, public housing. Um, you may be familiar with the VASH program of vouchers for homeless veterans. Um, which the Congress has been very, and the administration have been very supportive of. It's got $75 million a year for the last several years. That is not to be, is not proposed to be uh, continued as a separate line item. There is a, not in the slide here, but in the budget, there's a proposal to create a $177 million fund of vouchers for homeless uh, families, tribal families, and, uh, and veterans that are um, uh, either homeless or threatened by homelessness or, or potential victims, actual victims of domestic violence, of dating violence, it says. Um, other, other programs uh, proposed to be continued, I think it's been a while since the Indian Housing Block Grants and the HASDA program has gotten any increase, so there's a small increase proposed there. A substantial increase, you can see there, of more than $300 million proposed for the McKinney Homeless Assistance Programs. Um, and then a few others, the, the Section 202 uh, Senior Housing Program and the Section 811 uh, Housing for the Disabled Programs get substantial increases also. Housing Counseling also got, gets a, a substantial increase. And the SHOP program, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, has been a separate part of a separate freestanding small account, and, uh, and again, this year is proposed by the administration to be part of as, as a set-aside in home. Um, this is just a, an overview of some of the, not all, but some of the uh, more prominent uh, budget increases proposed. And again, as I was saying, it's a very aggressive and, and positive uh, budget from the administration uh, if you're a, uh, as someone interested in, in affordable housing, a uh, $4 billion increase from the current appropriated level. Um, oops. There's uh, several, oops, wow. <clears throat> There's several new ideas or new proposals in the, um, in the budget. Um, all uh, presidential budgets have, have things like this every time. Um, one uh, that's of interest to, to rural practitioners is that the budget proposed to increase the colonia set-aside in CDBG from 10% to 15%. 
and that's that's obviously in the colonial U.S. Mexico border areas in those states of Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, so part of part of CDBG. Um, a couple of new ideas that they have written in, and that uh, uh, presumably would require some authorizing language, and that presumably will be further spelled out. But they have something called the 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 upward mobility project, and that is a blending together of two HUD programs, Home and CDBG, and then the social services uh, block grant and the community service. Uh, services block grant to uh, health and human services department programs uh, to to put them together not not as one pot of funds but with sort of an overview template of coordinating those programs uh, 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 better and it, it says that up to ten states or localities could blend this funding together um, in exchange for more accountability and proposals that these states or localities might might make, then they would get more flexibility in using those programs. So at first glance, that sounds like, uh-oh, they're proposing to turn all these into one block grant, but that's, that's actually not it. Those four programs stay separate, um, but this is a new kind of template strategy to, to kind of coordinate them better. Um, and then a second uh, new idea that's in the budget is something called local housing policy grants. And that would be a new $300 million program of funding, as it, as it says here, uh, to localities and regional coalitions uh, to support new ideas, programs, policies, regulation, regulatory initiatives on uh, things like design, uh, process changes, uh, different regulations about land use. So both of these are not very very much spelled out yet, uh, but we'll, we'll try to be tracking these to see what happens to these also. Um, Oops, sorry. <sighs> sorry. Um, HUD has sometimes had small programs that are that are specifically for rural. Some of you on this call have probably used those programs before. None of them are in this budget. You may recall that they had one year of something called the Rural Innovation Fund. And they had about eight or nine years of the Rural Housing and Economic Development Program that preceded the Rural Innovation Fund. Uh, those have both now kind of gone away and are not in this in this budget proposal. The Rural Capacity Building Program that's been around for about three years now is also not not in the budget. And that is pretty much the end of my uh, presentation. This is just a a quick uh, slide here on HACK, uh, what we do, our financing programs, training, technical assistance, search and information. We have a number of special initiatives and also our website there is, is at the top. Uh, so that's a, a, a resource for further, further <coughs> information. Um, Leslie and I, our, our emails were at the beginning of the um, uh, presentation and we're still um, available to answer any, any questions that you might have later you know, by email or telephone, they're there. But we're also now ready to take any of your any of your questions that you might have. And and we're not going to cut things off. We'll keep going as long as you guys want to talk about any of this. All right. Well, I have a question that's coming here. I'm going to read off the question so everyone can hear them and then uh, leave it to our panel of experts to give us the answers. So one question we have is, are there good alternatives to the minimum rent proposal? Are there, i.e., ways to reduce rental assistance costs? Good question. Um, yes, there are. We have, HEC and a number of our organizations have been working together to identify possibilities. There are a lot of ideas ranging from pretty straightforward things like not requiring a CPA audit of every property every year, which has, as I understand it, yielded zero reports of any funding anomalies over the years and could save, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but could save a bunch of money if properties didn't have to do those. And then there are some that some things that could be done legislatively um, to change the way 
funds are handled um, and everything in between. So there are a lot of options there that would be more effective and less onerous on tenants than the minimum rent. All right. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, I've got a question. This is probably more for Joe, but uh, what are the chances of bringing back the HUD, RHED, or RAF programs? Um, well, I don't know. That's a, that's a very good question. I, I think a lot of people who work in rural areas would like to see them um, um, uh, come back. Uh, um, you know, it, it's sort of up to the administration, up to the Congress as to, as, as to whether they would they would uh, they would happen again. Uh, so it's so it's so it's hard to say what the what the real chances are. They have been gone for several years, and it's often to bring it's often difficult to bring programs like that back once they've been out of the budget for for two or three years or more. So. Um, it looks like uh, Rob Prash wanted to ask a question. If you would, Rob, please uh, type your question into the Q and A box in the lower right hand corner. That way we can get to it. Uh, Anytime we open up the lines, it just becomes a mess of, a cacophony of noise. So we tend to keep that a uh, little quieter. But I have a question here. What do you know about the transformation initiative, uh, which, is, which is TA? Will it have a rural component? Do you have any familiarity with that? You're talking about the HUD, the HUD, HUD transformation. The HUD transformation initiative. It's it's described in in the budget as as a combination of of small amounts from a number of programs. Um, um, frankly, I don't know what I don't I don't think most of us know what's going to happen with that. Uh, you know, again, it's a proposal out there uh, from HUD, uh, and again, we'll be trying to track track more of that. Uh, as it as it goes along, I think it's not fully fully fleshed out yet. It's an idea that that HUD has had around for 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 several years. Okay. Uh, another question we have here is: How does the USDA rural housing budget compare to past Obama budget requests? It is higher than um, at least for most programs than the budget requests have been in the past. For example, the last couple of years, they tried to they proposed reducing the amount for the 502 direct program. Last year's budget requested only 360 million for it, although it had been appropriated 900 million the last couple of years. This year, the budget goes up to 900 million again. Um, maybe this is the result of the administration being kind of. Uh, on its way out, and since they're lame ducks, they can request. They can they can be generous. Um, I'm not sure what the reasoning for that is, but for the USDA programs anyway, it's um, a bit higher. They have, I should say, though, um, tried to cut the 523 self-help program in past budgets, and then that proposal is raised again this year. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, what are the new HUD secretary's views on rural housing? Um, sure. Well, that's that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, many of you on the call were probably at the HAC uh, national conference that we had back in December, and I forget if it was on December third or fourth. But the new HUD secretary uh, Julian Castro was there and and spoke in a, a dialogue kind of uh, keynote uh, 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 format with Moises Lowe, our executive director. And uh, we're actually working on a version of that that um, address to be in our next issue of our magazine, Rural Voices. And, and Dan, don't we have it on the on our website? If, if you go to ruralhome.org and page through the slideshow on the home page, you can see a uh, a blog post essentially which has excerpts from the speech including uh, his answer to basically that exact question and and we you know we we seem to think that he was quite supportive of, of uh, rural America and rural housing um, 
And he, I, I know in the, um, the Q&A session with members of the audience, he actually did very well in, 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 in answering those questions. Uh, so I would, I would uh, refer you to our website and, and to the article that we're going to have, we hope we're going to have coming up as a, as, a, as a piece in the next Rural Voices. And be okay with the Rob. <laughs> we have a question that Rob Price did get his question in. Uh, does does the HUD 202 811 funding include any capital advance funding, or is it only rental assistance? Rob, I'm not I'm not sure about that. I will um, I will try and figure that out, and I'll email you about it. That that's a good question. Uh, oh, okay. um, uh, there's a fairly extensive question from Veronica Biting that I think we might have to answer offline. Uh, I don't know if, Leslie, if you can lend anything to that, but it's... Uh, I'm, I'm not... Oh, here it is. Is there any chance the direct loan estimated fees will ever reduce? Um, yeah, I I think I'd have to do some research to answer this, but we can certainly talk or email offline. Thanks. And uh, why is the VASH program for homeless veterans out of the budget? Um, yeah, that's that. That's an excellent question. In in talking to some of my friends that work for some of the homeless organizations, I think they're saying that that it's 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 general generally recognized that there's been a huge amount of progress on on um, on ending veteran homelessness. Uh, I forget the exact figures, but it's about half the total number of homeless veterans that there were just a few years ago. So it's been a big success. And, and I think it's not that the VASH program has been ended. It's now been sort of blended into this new uh, $177 million account that, that I mentioned. Um, and, you know, if you want to email me, I'd be glad to try to provide more details on that. Um, uh, and and I, I, it, it, it remains to be seen, I guess, as to how much of that actually might get used for, for, um, for, for homeless veterans. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can HACK help us resurrect 202 and 811 for new construction with Section 8 uh, and allow leveraging with 9% LIHTC? Um, uh, you know, I think HACK is, is, is certainly su supportive of that. Um, that's, that's probably a better question for some of the senior housing uh, organizations such as uh, such as Leading Age, but we'll be we'll be keeping up with that that also. Um, are there any questions we have not gotten gotten to? That's it. Um, oh, Jeff asks: Are the renewals made at the national level or at the state level? What are the I guess the rental assistance renewals? Um, I don't think I'm understanding the question. I'm not. I think it's probably the uh, renewals for the rental assistance contracts. Are they made, does the national office make those decisions or state USDA offices? That's my assumption. Ah, uh, if that's not the, um, the way the question is supposed to be interpreted, please ask it again. They're actually, I don't know what level a USDA office makes that decision. I'm told the request goes to the area office. And if there's funds available, they compete. Yep. That's area office. Oh, the area offices compete for the national pool of rental assistance money. Would you like the microphone? <laughs> Great. All right. 
um, that seems to be all of the questions we have. If uh, Again, if you have any additional questions, you can see uh, Joe and Leslie's emails are on the screen. Feel free to reach out to either one. Um, and I could I could go back to Rob Prash's question. I I think about about the 202 and 811 capital advance. It, it appears there's there's not much new capital advance at all. It's um, uh, 365 million to renew and amend uh, uh, current operating subsidy contracts, uh, and 73 million for service coordinators, and then a few other small pieces. But again, we'll we'll look at that further. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Joe and Leslie for their presentation. It was a lot of information, and hopefully we're all more informed. Uh, we hope, uh, I, and as I said at the beginning, uh, materials from this webinar will be available on HACS website, which is www.ruralhome.org.